Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in house if you'll be so kind to make that last courtesy check that your cell phones have been turned off. It's always appreciated. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation for everyone's future reference. And our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Cully Stimson. Mr. Stimson is manager of our National Security Law Program. He is also a senior legal fellow in the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. He is a nationally recognized expert on national security, homeland security, as well as crime control. He writes and lectures widely on these issues, as well as military detention and commissions, intelligence and criminal law, immigration, and the war on drugs. Before joining us here in 2007, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs. He has also worked as a prosecutor at the local, state, and federal levels. He has served for three tours on active duty in the Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps as well. Please join me in welcoming Cully Stimson. Cully. <clears throat> Thank you very much, John. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to uh, Heritage on this second day of the summer, 2015. Um, a couple years ago, uh, my colleagues here at Heritage formed uh, an Ebola task force to look at um, the policy decisions uh, and the actions our federal government uh, took uh, with respect to the Ebola outbreak. The task force's mandate was to identify uh, and make certain findings on how the U.S. could better respond uh, to future crises. Uh, they issued a Heritage paper. Uh, these were scholars uh, in and outside of Heritage, uh, which was published on the 24th uh, of April this year. Three days later, we hosted a panel event entitled Ebola Outbreak and Response, Assessment of Initial U.S. Actions. We heard from Dr. Daniel Kaznuski from George Washington University, Peter Pham, Director of the Africa Center at the Atlantic Council, and our very own Dr. John O'Shea, Senior Fellow in the Center for Health Policy Studies. They, stu they shared their thoughts on state quarantines, federal and state preparedness, the World Health Organization, or WHO, preparedness and process to deal with Ebola, the role of U.S. doctors and the Centers for Disease Control, and other related domestic issues. But that's not the whole story, and which brings us to today's panel. And I think it's altogether fitting uh, that on the day after Memorial Day, uh, we highlight DOD's uh, critical medical research and development role in fighting the Ebola virus. Theirs is a story, quite frankly, that's not well known and hasn't been well publicized, but one which is nevertheless impressive and was critical to stemming the tide. We've assembled uh, leaders of four key DOD organizations who are dedicated to protecting our war fighters. Uh, and our country against injury and disease to include Ebola. Now, I'm not a doctor, but as a 23-year veteran of the Navy, I have immense respect for what DOD can bring to the table in almost every area of national defense. Uh, and I follow the task force's work closely. And in civil society, I happen to know one of the key uh, leaders uh, in the DOD medical research field who, when speaking with him at a social event, we thought that we needed to tell DOD's story a little better, and Heritage is delighted uh, to do so today. The format for today's event is quite simple. Uh, I'm going to sit down and be quiet, uh, and I'm going to turn to the experts, and we're going to go in the order in which they're sitting. Uh, each will make prepared remarks, assisted by uh, some PowerPoint slides, perhaps, uh, and at the end of their uh, collective um, talks, uh, I'll moderate uh, a Q&A. Carmen Spencer is the Joint Program Executive Officer for Chemical and Biological Defense, JPEO-CBD, 
as in that position, he provides acquisition management and professional leadership on complex management issues related to joint service chemical and biological defense acquisition programs. He plans, directs, manages, and coordinates the execution of that mission and is responsible for the development, acquisition, distribution, and deployment of highly specialized and dynamic joint chemical and biological defense devices, as well as medical diagnostic systems, drugs, and vaccines. He also provides management oversight for the chemical demilitarization program, an acquisition category 1D program for the Assistant Secretary of the Army and Army Acquisition Executive. He received his BS degree from Chaminade University in Hawaii. Colonel Russell E. Coleman, PhD, is the Joint Program Manager of the Joint Project Management Office for Medical Countermeasure, Countermeasure Systems headquartered in lovely Fort Detrick, Maryland. He leads the DOD organization responsible for the development, acquisition, and fielding of Food and Drug Administration approved medical countermeasures to chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. He is the author of over 85 peer-reviewed scientific publications and has been the primary investigator on NIH, World Health Organization, and DOD grants. In 1995, Colonel Coleman deployed to Zaire as part of a WHO team responding to an Ebola virus outbreak, and in 2003, he was deployed for Iraqi, Operation Iraqi Freedom as the Chief of Preventative Medi Medica, Medicine Section of the 520th Theater Army Medical Laboratory. In 2008, he became Deputy Commander of the U.S. Army Medical Material Development Activity. He was selected as the 10th Commander of that organization in 2010 and served in this position until 2013. He received his B.S. in biology from the State University of New York, you'll tell by his accent, he's a New Yorker, a master's degree in medical etymology from the University of Tennessee, and a doctorate in medical etymology from the University of Massachusetts. Colonel Stephen J. Thomas, MD, is the deputy commander for operations in Ebola response management team lead at Walter Reed Army Institute of, Medi uh, Army Institute of Research, U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command. He also serves as the infectious diseases consultant to the Army Surgeon General. He is the chief operating officer for that enterprise, which encompasses over 2,000 military, U.S. government, civilian, foreign national, and contract employees, and laboratory facilities in NORTHCOM, UCOM, AFRICOM, PACOM. Colonel Thomas is also an internationally recognized virologist and vaccinologist and spent more than five years of his early career living and working in Thailand and other areas in Southeast Asia. He, too, has authored more than 55 articles and seven book chapters and routinely represents Army medicine's expertise by speaking at national and international scientific events. He sits on expert scientific committees and boards for the DOD, NIH, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and numerous pharmaceutical companies working on U.S. military development priorities. He took his bachelor's degree with honors in biomedical ethics from Brown University and a medical degree from Albany Medical College. Finally, Colonel Neil E. Woolen, DMV MSS PhD, is the director of biosecurity at U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. This is one Army acronym I do know. Yes, U.S. AMRID. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Sir. All right. A biological defense laboratory that is part of the U.S. Army Medical Research and Materiel Command. During his first tour of duty at U.S. AMRID, he participated in Ebola outbreak investigations in Kikwit, Zaire, and the Thai forest of the Ivory Coast, as well as animal outbreak investigations and field studies in the Northwest Territories of Canada and Montana for anthrax, plague, and other diseases. In 2010, Colonel Woolen returned to U.S. AMRID, where he served in his current position while also completing senior service college through the distance education program at the Army War College. He received his doctorate in veterinary medicine in 1985 and a doctorate in veterinary pathology in 1989, both from Kansas State University. He also received a master's degree in strategic studies in 2012 from the U.S. Army War College. Mr. Spencer, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Um, first off, thanks, Kelly, for giving DOD the opportunity to tell his story. Uh, that's kind of rare for us. You know, when you tell folks that your job in life is preparing the armed forces for chemical and biological and radiological events, uh, you're not the most popular guy at cocktail parties. And uh, most people just run away. So we do appreciate the opportunity. Um, our mission is, is pretty simple, actually. And what we do in DOD, we develop the medical countermeasures um, to combat chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. Uh, and the threats are real. When we look at the last four years and what we've experienced in global crisis around the globe, we've had three major events. Um, in March 2011 at Fukushima, when three of six nuclear generators went down, uh, creating a global crisis, DOD was there for the response. Um, in August of 2013, uh, the use of chemical weapons in the country of Syria, and the U.S. was called upon as part of a U.N. effort and in support of a U.N. effort, and we destroyed those Syrian chemical weapons. So we had the R, the N, and the C, and then, of course, as we're here today to talk about in April of last year with the Ebola outbreak, and then we had the biological. So three out of the last four years, major global threats that DOD has had to respond to. Um, despite numerous, you know, smaller scale outbreaks, we still don't know the origins, uh, the natural vector, or the carrier of the Ebola virus. Um, it's highly contagious on its own, we all know that. It's a pathogen that poses a risk of deliberate misuse with significant potential for mass casualties or devastating effects. The DOD has been engaged in research and countermeasure development for many years, and during that time we've developed a number of unique capabilities. This outbreak, though, posed some new challenges for us. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea had never experienced a widespread epidemic of this kind. Moreover, the public health infrastructure presented challenges. A lack of trained medical professional was a critical problem. For example, before the epidemic started, the CIA reported that for every doctor in Liberia, there were 100,000 patients. In the U.S., that ratio is roughly 242 doctors for every 100,000 patients. The affected populations were large, mobile, and urban. Local funeral customs included prolonged exposure to the infected disease, deceased personnel. Um, in responding, there's a limited, very limited incentive for private industry to proactively develop response tools, whether they're diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, or other related equipment. Uh, even with therapeutics and vaccines in development, largely with support from the U.S. government, the path to FDA approval is somewhat unclear, and no mass production capability for these materials is readily available. Um, and in the response, DOD did not lead the response. We were part of a massive whole of government response and in support of a whole of government response. And it really was a great example of the interagency working and pulling together for a common cause. Um, you know, our government is bureaucracy. In time of crisis, it's amazing what we can accomplish in short order. And this certainly was a time of crisis. Uh, even within DOD, it was a team approach, as you see these gentlemen here. Uh, not only was my office that's responsible for the life cycle development of these products involved, but we also had medical countermeasures uh, systems that leads the effort to develop and require safe, effective, and innovative medical solutions. The Walter Reed Army Medical Institute of Research, or RARE, conducts biomedical research that's responsive to needs and delivers life-saving products that sustain the combat effectiveness of all of our warfighters. And of course, the United States Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, or USAMRID, is the lead laboratory for medical biological defense research. Uh, let me talk just for a few minutes to give you an overview of the response. The response was four-pronged, identifying the causative agent, providing diagnostic tools, treating the infected, and preventing further infection. The diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, and quarantine protocols developed by the Department of Defense provided the core 
for this response. USAMRID and RARE and others within, within the DOD partnered to respond to the outbreak. MCS under Colonel Coleman's leadership provided diagnostic biosurveillance efforts and accelerated production efforts. It also accelerated the development and production of two experimental drugs that Colonel Coleman will discuss in his presentation. And lastly, uh, MCS also funded clinical trials for Ebola vaccines. The planning and executing of a safe deployment of U.S. forces relied on rare pre-deployment training and global biosurveillance. The results of the training speak for themselves. While deployed, no American service members contracted Ebola, or for that matter, malaria, a disease which infected 44 of 150 deployed Marines in 2003. USAMRID supported training and consultation on patient care, transport, and dead body management. They rapidly helped fill public health knowledge gaps in the outbreak arena. In conclusion, given the events of the last four years, Fukushima, Syria, West Africa, we know that these threats are not academic and that surprise is becoming routine. Preparing a response to unknown threats requires massive flexibility. Preparation from biosurveillance to intelligence, research, development, planning, and coordination is key to minimizing or containing the next major event. The U.S. Department of Defense is leading the way in each of these areas. Thank you again, and thank you to the Heritage Foundation, Foundation for hosting this event, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A period. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will introduce Colonel Neil Wallen. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to be able to represent the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases and talk to you about the uh, contributions that that organization has recently made. As has been pointed out, I'm a veterinarian and I'm currently serving as the Director of Biosecurity at USAMRID. And USAMRID's mission is to provide solutions, provide capabilities to service members in the way of medical countermeasures to counter a bio threat. The hallmark, I believe, from this outbreak response is if you see the bottom line of this slide where it says medical biological defense insurance policy for the nation, this is what our commander wants us to be. Everyone that walks into that building daily, this is what he wants us to be. The irony of this is that solutions built for biodefense were readily and easily transferable to a real world outbreak of infectious diseases. And I think that's one of the hallmarks. Uh, of this current outbreak response. This next slide shows you what we consider to be our mission essential task lists at USAMRID. Mission essential task lists are simply core capabilities that the organization must excel at for it to be successful in its contribution to the global effort. And these are what the commander has established for USAMRID providing world-class expertise in medical biological defense to rapidly identify biological agents train and educate the force daily and everywhere we go, establish biosafety, biosecurity, and biosurety uh, capabilities and protocols, and then develop and test and evaluate medical countermeasures. Most importantly, the last one is to prepare for tomorrow's problems through being pre prepared for elements of uncertainty. USAMRID has a legacy research program that has given us a wealth of, of knowledge and experience in working with the Ebola virus. USAMRID, uh, you know, has a basic science program as its core um, fundamental element of contribution to where it works on both uh, discovery and development of medical countermeasures, and it has done that with Ebola for several years. It leverages this uh, in field activities as well. Uh, Kikwit outbreak in 1995 was one of my first experiences with Ebola, and it's one that I'll bring to your attention today as a field experience we had. But USAMRID's presence in outbreak investigations predates the 1995 uh, Kikwit outbreak. And then again in Cote d'Ivoire, this was a very unique uh, field uh, situation because in Cote d'Ivoire, the concern was that the virus may be high up in the canopy. It never looked at species high up in the, in the canopy, and we partnered with uh, other nations uh, in this effort to develop catwalks uh, through the canopy 
and trap and, and collect blood from species that live high up in the canopy rather than on the forest floor. We brought an element of experience to these and coupled with our interagency and international partners, built strong teams, both in Kikwit, where we work predominantly in, in, in uh, collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization, and then Cote d'Ivoire with the World Health Organization. This is a pretty busy slide. This shows our entire portfolio of, of areas that we are currently working on, the research development and test and evaluation. But I want to draw your attention to the four uh, bolded uh, bullets on these slides. Ebola and Marburg therapeutics, Ebola and Marburg vaccines, and then the Joint Biological Agent Identification and Detection System, and the Ebola virus diagnostics. <clears throat> vaccines and therapeutics, uh, USAMRID, I think that there may only be one of the current candidates that has not passed through uh, USAMRID for some form of testing and evaluation. So USAMRID uh, supports this effort heavily, has a lot invested in looking at these various candidate uh, therapeutics uh, and vaccines. The Joint Biological Agent Identification Detection System was heavily tested and it was one of those field trial tests that we did. Uh, when we were talking in, my in the introduction of me about the times we spent up in the Northwest Territories of Canada looking at natural outbreaks, we would take those to the field and try to field test them. And then it, most importantly, the Ebola uh, Zaire diagnostic for this outbreak, it provided a, a um, uh, real-time diagnostic capability on the ground. And I want to I want to take just a moment to highlight that because when I was in Kikwit in 1995, one of the critical things that was missing was the ability to diagnose real time on the ground because every patient after the first patient was diagnosed as Ebola, any patient after that that looked like Ebola went into the Ebola ward. During this outbreak with real time diagnostics on the ground, we were able to set up screening capabilities to where patients could be tested and then sent to a different uh, treatment facility if they were not positive for Ebola. So this is critical. This assay was also uh, approved by the FDA emergency use authorization to be able to diagnose uh, uh, samples from U.S. citizens on the ground. We've talked a little bit about rapid diagnostics already. USAMRD is part of the National Laboratory Response Network. USAMRD had years of experience in operational support to deployable laboratories. And USAMRD is part of the, con the uh, Cooperative Biological Engagement Program. And we were actually in West Africa since, two or have been in West Africa since 2006, helping nations develop diagnostic capabilities for loss of fever and other hemorrhagic fever viruses. Most of those efforts got channeled towards Ebola um, as early as March uh, in Sierra Leone and then April uh, in Liberia to combat uh, the current outbreak. We also put genomic capabilities on the ground in Liberia. The intent for that was to be able to monitor the virus, to, to be able to track any genetic changes in the virus, because if it would genetically mutate during the outbreak, a lot of the vaccines and therapeutics may not work. So we wanted to be able to track that throughout the outbreak. Training, education, consultation, a number of standard publications were used as reference materials and core training courses, but I want to highlight the other Operation United Systems support. This is where USAMRD personnel stood up to the challenge to add additional training that's not part of their core element. They provided over four, training to over 4,000 deploying personnel on how to don and doff personal protective equipment, invested over 1,800 man hours to do that. Um, they also consulted with um, various agencies on dead body management and patient transport to minimize the spread of Ebola infection throughout the course of an outbreak. And then the Field Identification of Biological Warfare Agents course is a standard course, but it was leveraged heavily by every laboratory capability that was going into Liberia to assist. This slide kind of shows a summary, and I've already talked about these, so I'm not going to run through these, but you'll see how each of the commander's mission essential task list or core capabilities were able to be brought to bear on this, this outbreak. And uh, USAMRD stands ready to do that in the future with any other agents that we have um, uh, a mandate to work on and, and therefore have the uh, training, knowledge, and expertise to do such. Bottom line is that USAMRD, USAMRD provides 
can, has provided and can continue to provide non-standard skill sets and solutions to operational problems that deal with infectious diseases of a high consequence uh, type of uh, organism. USAMRD is uniquely prepared uh, to support high consequence pathogen infectious disease outbreaks and we must be prepared for uncertainty of tomorrow. Thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. I'll be followed by Colonel Russ Coleman. So good afternoon. My name is Russ Coleman. And as you heard, Colonel Wool and I had the opportunity to deploy to Kikwit Zaire back in 1995. And I can still remember clear as day, my wife, who was seven months pregnant at the time, when I was coming home and she heard that, well, the Army was going to give me a thermometer and that if I got a temperature, they were going to throw me in the slammer. And the slammer, for those of you who don't know, is the isolation ward at USAMRID, where if you came down with something bad, something nasty, that's where they'd isolate you. My wife, knowing that there were no diagnostics, no therapeutics, no vaccines, and clearly concerned about her own health and the health of our unborn child, said, the heck with that. You throw in the slammer right now. <laughs> so you flash forward, you know, 95 to now, just about 30 years, and you'll look at where we are. And there were complaints, and we've all heard them, that, well, where are the drugs, where are the vaccines? But I think the story we're telling is we've really come a long way, and I'm going to highlight some of those issues. So I'm a advanced developer, and so what does that mean? And I've got to put that in the context. So you've heard from Colonel Woolen about USAMRID and all the science stuff that happens there. They investigate things like Ebola virus. They look at what are potential ways to block the virus from developing in a person. But that's basic science, and that doesn't get you a fielded drug or vaccine or therapeutic. And that's where my organization, the Joint Project Management Office for Medical Countermeasure Systems, comes into play. There's a handoff that occurs. So they've got this science going on, and aha, it appears they've got a potential therapeutic product for Ebola. And it transitions to my group, and we bring an entirely different set of skills to bear because my job is to take that science and work with a commercial company and somehow spit out a fielded product at the end that's approved by the FDA that we know is safe, that it's effective, and it's manufactured consistently. And so it's a different skill sets that exist in my group from what exists in Colonel Woolen's group or Colonel Thomas's group down at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And so what I'm going to talk to you now is some of the areas that we've been involved. And as Mr. Spencer said, nothing that we do takes place in a vacuum. So I may talk about what occurs in my organization, but the reality is we partner with RARE, we partner with USAMRID, we partner with commercial partners, we partner with the Centers for Disease Control, we partner with the NIH. It's a true collaborative effort at so many different levels. So I'm going to really highlight now a little bit about our history, how we got involved in the outbreak. I'm going to talk again, as I just mentioned, the whole of government approach that it really took. And for example, we work with RARE. On, they were doing some clinical trials to see how safe is this Ebola vaccine that they were working on. And we had a direct and relevant role partnering with them. Uh, we work with USAMRID on different assays, on different screens, different aspects of testing that were going on in their facility. And really, what you hear, the story that we're telling here is, throughout this whole Ebola outbreak, we remained agile and flexible and responsive. So as Mr. Spencer had mentioned, our mission in the Joint Program Executive Office is chemical and biological threats. You know, nefarious use of an agent for some evil purpose. But the reality is the compounds that have been weaponized, they also occur naturally. And so we've got the capability to provide, uh, to respond when these natural outbreaks occur. So on this chart, chart, and I don't know how clear, well, I would gather you can't see that at all from where you sit, but this really highlights the key areas that our organization actively was involved in. And it ranges up top, it's detection of the virus, we get into the treatment of the virus, and into vaccine development. And I'm not going to belabor any of this here, but this was a timeline that shows how and when and where 
we were involved. I've got some more detailed slides that I'll use to highlight some of these points. So when it comes to Ebola virus detection, our team, with our partners at USAMRID, we really identified the first cases in West Africa in this outbreak. Our assays that were on the ground there were used to detect the first cases. You've heard a lot about the cases here in the U.S., you know, the number of personnel who came back and were infected and the testing that took place, that was all conducted by the CDC. Well, the story that's not really told is that all of those assays were DOD-developed assays that with existing memorandums of agreement between the Department of Defense and the Department of Health and Human Services allowed us to provide our DOD assays to CDC because there was a gap there and we were able to support them in their mission. And so you may have heard about the Ebola Easy one assay. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, and you'll hear from me, is the challenges of developing these medical countermeasures. And when I, when I say that, what I mean is we're developing products that we hope will never be used. And that's a fundamental fact. We're developing products for threats that we don't know what, where, or when will occur we just know something will happen. As Mr. Spencer highlighted, over the past three years, we've seen a bio outbreak, we've seen use of chemical weapons, and we've seen nuclear. We really weren't able to predict any of those. And for example, when it came to bio, it could have been Ebola, it could have been something else, and we have to be prepared for all of it. The challenges that my group faces, though, is that when it comes to developing these countermeasures, we do this in partnership with commercial companies. And these are companies that are driven by return on investments. They've got to make money. And so the business model that exists is tremendously challenging. You know, hey, we want you to work with us and make these countermeasures, but you're probably not going to make any money doing it. And that's the reality of the business that we're in. And so it's extremely difficult. And so when you hear an outcry, you know, from the folks, let's say, in West Africa, hey, where were the drugs and vaccines? They should have been here. We absolutely agree with that. However, it's incredibly challenging. And the fact is that over the number of years, it's the US government, Department of Health and Human Services with NIH and BARDA, and it's been the DOD with our laboratories and our advanced developers who are conducting the research that goes into the development of these products. And that's really a fundamental point that it's important to understand. I'll get back to at the end with my comments about the challenge of getting these countermeasures actually commercialized and available. So back to virus detection, we've got a couple of assays here. And with diagnostics, we're trying to be prepared to respond to upwards of 20 or 30 different threats out there. It would be cost prohibitive to develop FDA-approved assays for everything in the near term, and we haven't been able to do everything we want. But what we had is we had assays that were pre-positioned with the Food and Drug Administration that had data that showed that they were safe and effective. And when this Ebola outbreak hit, in less than 30 days, we were able to get FDA approval under an emergency use authorization to use these assays. And that was a tremendous accomplishment, and that allowed us to, to move our assays forward throughout the U.S., working with the CDC, where they were available to detect Ebola in those patients. When it comes to Ebola treatment, obviously there are no, no currently FDA-approved therapeutics. That's a widely known story. They just don't exist. And it is a hard business when you take a virus like Ebola, which is highly lethal. You know, it's, is it 50% lethal? Is it 90% lethal? It's difficult to say, but we know it's highly lethal. And so this seeking out, and this is where USAMRID comes into play. They've been working on Ebola for many, many years and working, trying to find therapeutic products. And we have some great candidates, but the challenge comes, as I said, how do you get those approved by the FDA and with a commercial partner on board? And the story that's frequently lost is, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Midbo sitting here and his team in biological defense therapeutics, they had funded the development of a number of promising candidates. They had commercial partners. They had some data that showed these products were effective and safe, but not enough to get full FDA approval. And so by working with the FDA, we were able to take some of these compounds, and they were put into patients here in the U.S. on an emergency use basis and with the full support 
of our FDA. And so two compounds listed here are in Colonel Midbow's portfolio, favipiravir, which is a compound that it actually was developed by the Japanese for influenza, but it's effective against a wide range of viruses. So our team has been working on getting the data to show that this works against influenza, but also against Ebola. And so we were able to work with the FDA, and this went into, I believe, a total of 13 patients here in the US. Now at this point, we can't say for sure, did this product work in those patients? Because they were getting a whole smorgasbord, a cocktail of treatments, of which this is one of them. The second compound is Tecmira Ebola, and this is something that's interesting, because it's what's called a platform technology. And so what this means is you have a platform that's capable of spitting out a product on pretty short notice. And so you could have a platform established, and if something pops up like Ebola, in short order, you're able to identify the threat, sequence the genotype, and produce a compound that will hopefully be able to treat it. And in this case, we had a product that we were developing that was really for Ebola Zaire that was found in Kikwit. And it turns out that that strain of virus is different from the one that's currently circulating in West Africa. So working with our commercial partner in a span of, I want to say, two to three months, they were able to identify the sequence and develop a candidate product that was specific for the virus in West Africa. Now, there are some ongoing tests of this compound in West Africa, not done with us, but done with the European consortia. And again, this highlights once again the fact that the relationships that are needed to keep these products under development and keep them moving forward, it's just not DOD, it's not even just U.S. government. In many ways, they're international efforts. And the last tier of our three areas that work on is prevention, is that some of the vaccine work. And so we began working on Ebola vaccines back in 2010. And so that's our group in advanced development. But in the tech-based laboratories, they've been working on it far further than that. And so at the time of the outbreaks, we had what's called a trivalent vaccine effort ongoing. And that was a vaccine intended to treat not just Ebola Zaire, but Ebola Sudan and Marburg virus as well. And at the start of this outbreak, when it became clear, hey, we're dealing with Ebola Zaire, working with the DOD, and Health and Human Services, there were efforts to identify, is there a vaccine candidate that could treat the disease circulating in West Africa? And you've all heard about, I believe, the, what's called the VSV Delta G vaccine candidate. And that's, the testing has gone on at RARE, our group was involved, RID was involved, <laughs> NIH was involved. And so you'll hear more, I think Colonel Thomas, you'll touch upon that in your talk. So what I've tried to highlight is that when we talk about medical countermeasures, it's much more than just a science that has to take place. It's getting the commercial partners. It's a business model that exists. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the FDA Priority Voucher Program. So a number of years ago, it was recognized that we were not delivering medical countermeasures for some of those threats that occur in the less developed parts of the world you know, where diseases occur, that there's just not a commercial market. And so the U.S. Congress established an FDA priority voucher system that would incentivize industry to work on diseases, these neglected diseases that were seen mm -hmm. as, as of minimal importance. But what I would like to highlight is we face the same situation when it occurs to chemical, biological, nuclear threats, that we recognize they're important, but we have such a difficult time getting the commercial partners to work with us because of the lack of incentives. And that makes this business incredibly challenging. So at that point, you know, key points here, you've heard about how our organization has a long history working with other partners. You've heard about and will continue to hear more about uh, working with the other government agencies and our ability to deal directly with this outbreak. And my final point here is, need to really be proactive about looking at medical countermeasure development, whether it's Ebola or other threats that face our nation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Stephen Thomas. Okay, good afternoon. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. I'm going to tell you who we are, what we do, and how both of those were leveraged to uh, uh, participate in the Ebola response. 
So this is a picture of the rare. Um, it's located in Silver Spring, Maryland, just inside of the Beltway. Uh, we were established in 1893, so just over 120 years, so a very long time. Uh, we are the DOD's largest biomedical research facility. As you've heard before, we have around 2,100 U.S. government, uh, military, foreign service national, uh, and contract employees working not only in Silver Spring, but a number of locations um, around the world. And we work in two main areas. The first area would be behavioral health and brain health. So we work on issues like traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder. We work on sleep and the interface between sleep and performance. And then we work in areas of infectious diseases, and that's what I'm going to highlight for you today. So as long as we have had an army and as long as we have had a nation, infectious diseases have posed a threat, not only to the U.S. service member, but also to the citizen. And that occurs in peacetime and, and at war. And it occurs both here locally as well as um, overseas. And it's been the organization that I work for, our charge, um, to try and develop countermeasures to mitigate or to eliminate that threat to the service member and to the nation. And we have done that successfully for a number of years. And I list a couple of examples of just the vaccines that we have uh, developed. And these make a difference not only in military recruits, but those people that deploy um, overseas into harm's way. Um, we have done that successfully in the past, working on and, and figuring out solutions to past problems. But we're also looking at current threats and what the future threats may be. And you see a couple of examples there, things like HIV, dengue, malaria, and of course Ebola falls into that category as well. And we do that because we are an institution of competencies and capacities and, and research platforms. We have people that are not only experts in infectious diseases, but they also know how to do research and development. And to combine those two things is uh, important and very strategic. And in addition to the expertise that we have and, and the domestic platforms that we have, we also have a large network of overseas research capabilities. We have a behavioral health unit in Germany, which is currently in the process of transitioning to Washington State. We have a relatively new unit in the Caucasus just outside of Tbilisi, Georgia. And then we have a longstanding presence in Africa and in Southeast Asia. And these are very deep and enduring partnerships with host nations where we identify common threats and common interests and then work together at the government level, at the civil society level, and at the community level to try and come up with countermeasures that serve both of our needs. And as you'll hear, these platforms are incredibly important for the U.S. military and our countermeasure development activities. So that's who we are, and that's where we are, and that's what we do. How is this all leveraged for the Ebola response? The first you've already heard alluded to was the testing of vaccines. So when these vaccines complete their early development testing at places like USAMRID, they eventually need to be tested in, in humans. And that's a core competency that we have. And we do that both here domestically as well as overseas. So when the Defense Threat Reduction Agency came to us and asked if we wanted to participate uh, and were able to do the first human trial of this Ebola vaccine candidate, we were very pleased to be a part of that. And we did that. And we did it very quickly. And we were able to do that because we can, we're agile and we're able to redirect um, personnel and other resources to acute needs that arise. So in a very short period of time and in a small number of volunteers, we were able to demonstrate that the vaccine was safe and that it produced the immune response that we wanted it to. But we didn't do that in isolation. We worked with Dr. Fauci and Dr. Lane's team at the NIH to help them with a parallel study that they were doing at the same time with the same vaccine candidate. And we jointly published those results in the last couple of months. But it didn't stop at the U.S. government. We were also working with the World Health Organization because there were other groups that were also doing these small safety trials. And together, we were able to take all the blood samples, send them to USAMRID, and then USAMRID was able to generate the data that was required to make informed decisions about what vaccine dose needed to be used in West Africa. And you've probably seen the lay press. Those trials are ongoing right now. So as Colonel Coleman mentioned, it's not just DOD, it's not just whole of U.S. government, it's an international effort. And our vaccine trials that we were doing here in the U.S. were also being done overseas. 
And in fact, the vaccine trial we did at the RARE this past year, it wasn't the first time we had done an Ebola vaccine trial. Building on the military HIV research program, which has had a presence in Uganda for many years and collaborations in Uganda for many years, we did the first that I'm aware of, human vaccine trial on the continent of Africa starting back in 2008. And those results were just published as well. They just finished enrolling in a second Ebola vaccine trial in Uganda. And we are scheduled to start an Ebola vaccine trial in Nigeria. So I think this is a prime example and an exemplar of how the DOD is very good at expeditionary medicine, but more than that, expeditionary research and development. And I think that that is a unique characteristic of, of our organization. So that was the vaccine testing story, but we responded in other ways as well, to support Operation United Assistance and to support domestic Ebola preparedness. This was a different kind of operation than the 101st Airborne and other operational groups had been involved in before. And so it was very important to provide them pre-deployment training so that they understood what the threats and the risks were. And in my mind, Ebola was not the number one infectious diseases threat to the deploying force. It was falcipra malaria the most severe form of malaria. So we conducted a lot of pre-deployment infectious diseases threat briefings with the Southern Regional Medical Command and Brook Army Medical Center to all the deploying troops. You remember me telling you about the behavioral health side of our institution. Um, we also sent behavioral health teams to deploying troops to gain their understanding and perspectives about the operation that they were about to undertake and to understand what the specific mental health stressors may have been on that group. We also looked at controlled monitoring for that group. And that data is coming in and we're analyzing it now. And then if you remember back to that map, that large presence we have in Africa and the large presence we have in Southeast Asia, those nations had travelers returning from West Africa that they needed to test. And they needed to understand if Ebola was being imported into their borders. We've had 50 or 60 years of collaborating with some of these nations, and so we provided technical assistance to them. Again, the mutually beneficial relationship that we've had, again, in some cases for over half a century. Now, what you've heard is activities at the lab level and maybe at the program level. But I can tell you this was being tracked at the highest levels of the government. So the DOD Ebola Working Group, which was occurring in Assistant Secretary of <coughs> Defense Lumpkin's shop, OSD Policy Solik, they were responsible for coordinating the DOD response in West Africa. And so they coordinated DOD activities in support of USAID, which was the primary responder. They got all the different stakeholders together in DOD, and we ran through on a weekly basis all the issues that were confronting DOD and confronting the interagency. They represented the DOD with the joint staff at White House-led meetings, and they worked with Congress to make sure that people were remaining informed of what we were doing and why we were doing it. The point here, though, is that they were tracking very, very closely on a weekly basis all of this work that we were just telling you about. They wanted to know what were the vaccine trials, what were the results, what were the drug trials, where are they, when can they be deployed. And all this information was going up to the president. So that's a summary of what the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, um, what their contributions were to the uh, op supporting Operation United Assistance and supporting um, domestic Ebola preparedness. And I think taken with all the other uh, talks that you've heard, it gives you a pretty good idea of what the Department of Defense was, was doing. So I thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn it over to our host. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to commend you on not devolving into military acronym speak, uh, which I know is easy for, for folks uh, to do. Um, a few questions, and then I want to open it up to the entire room. Um, and this term may not be a term you have in the Army, but in the Navy we have a term, um, uh, and you may know this because you served in the Navy, hot wash. Hot wash is when after you do something, after you have an evolution, after you do a deployment, etc., you get all the stakeholders together and you sit around a table uh, or a room or a conference 
and you figure out what worked, what didn't work, what went wrong, how to sort it out, how to figure it out, and the best way forward. Um, I assume you've had some version or multiple versions of hot washes, not only within your various components, but across the DOD. Uh, and I was surprised to learn that Solik uh, was really uh, played the role they did. I, I think that's interesting. Uh, I would think it would be OSC Health Affairs, but a, a Solik makes sense. Um, and I'd like I'd just like to go down the row here and and ask you. Um, uh, what are the one, two, at most three top lessons learned from your perspective uh, through the Ebola response crisis management way forward? Carmen, I'll start with you. I think the, the biggest lesson for us uh, as DOD was no one agency within the federal government has all the answers. Uh, it is a whole of government response to any type of global crisis. And when it comes to something like a biological incident like Ebola, there are no borders. And it's not a DOD issue, it's a public health issue. And DOD has resources and can assist, but we don't have all the answers. And we must work as part of a whole of government team to provide the capabilities that we can provide. Colonel Woolen? One of the uh, phrases you hear almost to a point where you get tired of hearing it when you're a student in the U.S. Army War College is the term JIM, J-I-I-M, Joint Interagency Intergovernmental Multinational is what it talks about. And students there are encouraged to start thinking in that area if they haven't already started thinking before they come in. This outbreak rolled all that together. This has to be a joint interagency, intergovernmental, multinational type of solution. There can be no single agency uh, that can, can respond uh, to this type of an outbreak and, ha and bring to bear the resources that are needed to really be able to, to uh, render a positive solution uh, rapidly. The other thing that, that I, and I talked a little bit about this in my presentation, is that we cannot be a stovepipe in our thinking. Right. You know, as we develop solutions in the name of biodefense, we have to be thinking about how else can those be used and how else should those be used. And an infectious disease outbreak is a classic example of how something that is being developed for, for a relatively specific intent and purpose has tremendous uh, ability to be cross-leveraged for other purposes as well. Good point. Colonel Coleman? So on a similar thread, so by training, I'm a preventive medicine officer, and I think most people know that preventive medicine works, but it's also unappreciated, and sometimes, you know, physicians, for example, more time is spent on treating rather than preventing. But we know that prevention works, and in this case, I think we saw the value of the investments that have been made over a many-year period. Uh, we were trying to be prepared for any contingency that might occur, whether it's naturally occurring infectious diseases or a bioterrorism event. And we saw the benefits of that investment that had made, that prevention that people had the foresight for, and that we really were well positioned to provide support to this outbreak when it came to the R&D investments that resulted in whether it was the diagnostics, the vaccines, or the therapeutics. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the lesson learned uh, for me is that once again, uh, it's been proven that the world is a really small place. <laughs> and when you can get anywhere from one location to another in less than 24 hours, it is very possible for what is a West Africa issue to become a global issue. Um, and that can have incredible, uh, uh, certainly morbidity and mortality ramifications and financial ramifications and political ramifications. So to me, um, I think the requirement to enhance um, our biosurveillance networks globally uh, are of incredible importance. And it is not just the ability to uh, identify and detect and characterize a pathogen, but when you build biosurveillance, you are building public health infrastructure. It's dual purpose, um, which of course I think if uh, the 
West African nations uh, had not been so challenged in those uh, in those areas, there may have been a, um, a different a different outcome. So that's mm -hmm. the main lesson that, that I've gotten from mm -hmm. this. So uh, before I open it up, the last question I have is: so let's um, assume, for the sake of the question, that there is a verifiable outbreak in a West Africa country of what people highly suspect because of the biosurveillance is Ebola. Um, it happened this morning. This is a hypothetical, of course, um, uh, but not beyond the realm of possibilities. Um, walk us through, to the extent you can share, uh, uh, what each of your organizations does day one. What happens? We're talking about in DOD, in your, in right. your lane. In, our, in, in my lane, the first thing that would happen is Russ and I would be on a phone together <laughs> for, for a nice long phone call and getting the best and the brightest minds that we have together and basically wargaming it. Uh, what do we know? What don't we know? What are the capability gaps? What do we have on the shelf? Where do we need to put investment in the short term? to get the biggest bang for the buck um, and strategizing what's gonna happen over the next few weeks and how are we gonna be prepared and ready to meet that challenge. And Colonel Eric Midbell right here would be one of those guys because he's the guy who's making it happen. And um, that's, that's what my organization would be. But I assume uh, that in addition to phone calls and whatnot, <laughs> there's gonna be personnel eventually put in that area, American military personnel or, or doctors or civilians or somebody. Because I think the public, especially people who aren't uh, experts like you guys, assume, and they could be wrong, that we're going to have people on the ground here pr there pretty quickly to figure out what it really is, how, important, how widespread it is, et cetera. So and is that wrong? No, that's not wrong, but that, at that level, that's going to emanate uh, within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, within the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and we will react to the warning orders that they produce. Mm -hmm. So, and they're going to be asking us a lot of questions. And so that's why we get the best minds available to respond to their questions to include what would it take to provide a response. Uh, and in the case of Ebola, one of the first things we're going to want to know why we're going to want some people on, some smart people on the ground as soon as possible is, has been mentioned twice already, is to get a DNA sample to determine what strain we're dealing with. Um, Ebola is not gone today. It is dormant today, and it will come back, but it will morph. And it will be something different every time we see it, and we need to find out exactly what that is to determine the best and the most efficacious uh, therapeutic that we can provide and diagnostic assays. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wallen? I've been through this uh, three times now with Ebola, and it's basically been the same at USAMRID each time. And that is, until we get a request for assistance, you know, we're not doing anything. Now, the, the current Ebola outbreak was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I say we're not doing anything, meaning we're not pushing people out the door. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we are doing is is having meetings, uh, discussing you know that missing essential task list that I talked about, what capabilities we possess that could be brought to bear on the problem if asked to assist, and that's a standard. Whenever the first news of an outbreak hits, our commander starts convening those meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't even sometimes take the commander to initiate that. Uh, people that have a vested interest work in that daily uh, start thinking about, you know, what, what do we have available that could be brought to bear uh, if asked to do that. But it all then hinges on that request for assistance before we're going to engage. Now, this one was a little bit different, though, because we had a presence in West Africa. We had people on the ground as mm -hmm. part of a cooperative biological engagement program to build host nation capability and capacity for these types of diagnostics. So we were already over there doing that. And when Ebola hit, they rapidly transitioned specifically to Ebola diagnostics, both in Sierra Leone and, and then in Liberia. Dr. Coleman? So I think I'm going to build upon Colonel Woolen's comment there. So 
our mission really is to support the DOD and for DOD operations. So if an epidemic like this occurs in West Africa, that's really not a traditional DOD mission, and that's how it initially evolved before it became Operation United Assistance. Uh, I've got to look at what my capabilities are and what could be brought to bear, as Colonel Woolen said, but then I've got to figure out a way, how do I legally provide that support? Mm -hmm. And so we had to look at who our partners were and how they would be operating. So for example, CDC, responsible for homeland uh, defense in many ways, the diagnostics and so forth. We had to look at, do we have the mechanisms in place that would allow us to provide CDC with things that we had been working on? Likewise, when it came to those patients here in the U.S., uh, how do we provide our therapeutics that are U.S. government owned to respond? And we had to look at those mechanisms and figure out how can we provide this support. And those were conversations that took place with Mr. Spencer and up higher at OSD level as well. Mm -hmm. So what I think you've heard a couple times now is that it's, uh, it's not just the desire to go, but it's the ask. And, and that ask has to come through usually diplomatic uh, channels into the Department of Defense. If the ask is coming from, say, AFRICOM or Africa Command, uh, then my particular organization, what, what we can do, again, because we, we do expeditionary research and development, we can take the drug candidates or the vaccine candidates and we can relatively uh, quickly um, deploy, if you will, to start doing uh, um, trials <coughs> to demonstrate in the population of interest uh, safety and potential for clinical benefit, mm -hmm. and that my organization is a research organization. That's one of the things that we could uh, we could bring to bear. Mm -hmm. And again, in the process of doing that, you are setting up public health infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You are setting up uh, uh, surveillance systems. You are um, uh, educating the local communities, who are then um, uh, force multipliers, if you will, and helping you in mm -hmm. uh, achieve uh, your mission. Mm -hmm. So, anything anyone else wants to add on the panel? to respond or add to anything any of the other panelists have said? Negative response. All right. Uh, <laughs> if you have a question, we'd be delighted to hear it. Simply raise your hand, and one of my colleagues with the microphone will come to you, and then please identify yourself by name and organization and ask your question. Lady in the front, please. Uh, Victoria Gao from the Commerce Department. Thank you wow. so much for your um, trailblazing work. Um, and uh, I feel a lot safer with you <laughs> walking on the wall. Thank you very much. Um, my question, because I'm from Commerce Department, mm -hmm. my questions are going to be more um, on the R&D and commercialization of the products mm -hmm. that you're working on. Um, I would assume that, uh, you know, in addition to the voucher system, the fast track system, where uh, you're probably going to get faster review and probably extension of the patents, I mean, are there any uh, considerations on AMCs, which are advanced market commitments, um, mm -hmm. guaranteeing mm -hmm. these companies um, certain markets, you know, like a certain future contract, so they would be incentivized to go through with the commercializations? And, and also, once these products are, are finished, I mean, are they subjected to compulsory licensing under mm -hmm. the TRIPS agreement? Um, and Bonus question, <coughs> bonus, is that right? Um, patient consent during crises, um, you know, what, I mean, a lot of these um, diagnostics and a lot of the, the drugs you use are, may be approved in this country, but obviously they probably are not c approved in West Africa. And during crises, are they, do you get, get a blanket um, patient consent to use on, you know, on the, on the West, Afri West African populations? So I guess probably between the two of us, we can handle that one. So yes, we talk to commercial companies about their ability to provide us long-term with their product. Uh, it's important to understand, though, that the DOD requirements are relatively tiny. So for example, when we're developing vaccines, we may require 400,000 doses. And depending on the shelf life, we may only need that every couple of years. Very small number. And when you talk about the costs and the investment that companies have to make, as I said, there's a lot of reluctance on their part to say this is something we are going to take our resources and put them towards. And so even that small licensing commitment is, in many cases, not enough. So I'm glad you mentioned this, you know, the FDI priority vouchers, patent extensions, and that sort of thing. 
those are the types of discussions that I believe we need to get into because if you truly believe that this is a, national, a strategic national priority, our ability to respond to these sorts of outbreaks, whether they're naturally occurring like Ebola or a chemical or biological weapons event, we've got to somehow be able to crack the code on it. And right now is, I believe, the most difficult aspect of this whole process. We have great scientists doing great things, coming up with potential technologies. It's getting them across the finish line. Now, I think the second part of your question was related to cons a what is our desired end state. I mean, for the DOD, we want FDA-approved products. That is the gold standard, and that is what we strive for. In this case, we did not have FDA-approved products. However, the FDA has mechanisms that allow these not across the finish line products to be used, like an EUA, emergency use authorization, like expanded use protocols. And so during this outbreak, we took full advantage of those. EUA was used with the diagnostic products. Uh, emergency INDs were used for taking some of these experimental compounds and treating individual patients here in the US. And those did involve informed consent. So there's a whole spectrum of tools potentially available but we've got to adhere to those requirements established by the FDA to ensure you know, patient safety first and foremost. And now I'll turn it over to the physician, <laughs> Rupier. And so in terms of the US-based vaccine trials, we were able to move faster than usual, but it was not because we skipped any regulatory steps or any ethical steps. We, um, we just focused a lot of resources and we were able to do things in parallel versus sequentially, which is how that normally works. Um, we, my organization is not involved um, in the, uh, the vaccine trials that are ongoing in West Africa now, so I, I cannot comment from a, from a, a first-person view, but uh, what I can say from the experience we have had with field trials in other parts of the world, uh, informed consent is always a component of that, and actually um, assent, so children that are uh, able to understand basic concepts are, um, uh, if that is a population that's involved, um, that is also always a component of, of what, we, uh, what we do. So uh, my assumption is, and, and I, I would be very surprised if it was not the case, is that that is also ongoing in West Africa now. And, and these countries have their own ethical review committees and their own regulatory um, uh, frameworks as well. So these are not being done in a, in a vacuum. So your question in multiple parts, did we touch upon yeah. all the parts? We get the bonus? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. One thing that I'll add to what my colleagues have just commented on <clears throat> is that what we're talking about is a low frequency but high impact disease. And you've kind of hit on the subject already about how do you commercialize these. So one of the things that has been looked at by the several of the scientists that are working on therapeutics, not so much on the vaccine side because it's a little bit more difficult to do, but on the therapeutic side is repurposing drugs that have another intended purpose but have significant potential merit to also treating Ebola virus. And, and you also get a leapfrog type of start with repurposing other types of drugs that are also being researched uh, for another type of disease because you can leverage those early clinical trial data on safety testing uh, that can help push, prom propel that forward towards a solution. So that's another area that a lot of the scientists are looking at in therapeutic development. You know, we've mentioned priority vouchers, and I thought it was great that the FDA, uh, I'm not sure if it was the FDA specifically, but we got the legislation added where Ebola was added to that list, eligible for FDA priority vouchers. That's terrific, but it occurred in the middle of an outbreak, and that's not the optimal time to be thinking about these things. So when you look at drug or vaccine development cycles, which are many, many years, in order to be prepared, you've got to be doing that thinking far in advance. So this is great that we're able to respond agilely and fairly flexibly, but we could have been better positioned if we had some of the tools in place in advance. Mm -hmm. And those are the incentives that I'm talking about, like the FDA priority vouchers. And that's what we're looking at now is the preparedness piece. You know, when a crisis hits, that's the worst time to exchange business cards. Uh, we've got to be prepared, rehearsed, and ready for any eventuality, anytime, anywhere on the planet. And, and that's what we're concentrating our efforts on now. And I, I do think that this speaks to why the Department of Defense needs to be involved in infectious diseases R&D and countermeasure development, because a lot of the problems that we work on do not necessarily have a large market share. 
and it's not necessarily going to be the case that there is a corporate entity or a pharmaceutical entity that will be willing to take it on. But the U.S. service member still needs a countermeasure. They still need uh, that drug or that, that vaccine to protect them when they deploy. And so the Department of Defense, in some cases, has to be the one taking the initiative to develop it, and in all cases needs to have a seat at the table uh, to ensure that the military gets what it needs. Other questions? Yes, sir. John, with the tie in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Ivan Ruzik from Behavior Matrix. Uh, thanks to the panel, by the way. This has been a great session, I think. Um, I'd like to build on, the qu on a question that, uh, and a comment that uh, um, Colonel Thomas made. You know, given that you can get from you know, Monrovia to Uganda to Calcutta in 24 hours, given that we have a lot of, of um, host workers in these countries, given that the World Health Organization and other civilian institutions fail to respond in a timely manner, I'm interested in your views about the need for a global indications and warning system, be it civilian or be it military. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about biosurveillance. And, and a number of the panel members have stressed the importance of biosurveillance. That's, that's a global capability because it is a public health issue. And we are doing a number of things around the planet now to increase our biosurveillance capabilities because that is the early warning and the indicators. Um, we can say anything we want, but the human is, is going to be the early warning signal. And then it's a question of time. So our biosurveillance efforts right now, and DOD is leading the way in biosurveillance, uh, is going to be the cornerstone uh, of that early warning system and we're expanding it as fast as we rapidly can. Um, and you, you can learn more about it. It's, it's called the Global Viral Surveillance System. Yeah, so the Department of Defense has the Global Emerging Infections Surveillance and Response System. It's led by Colonel Jim Cummings, who's also an infectious diseases physician. They're in approximately 70 countries, and that's both DOD, academic, and um, uh, host nation government facilities. But it's not enough. The network in West Africa is not as robust as it should be or needs to be. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's an issue for the people who allocate resources and who prioritize programs. But I, I, I am a, a staunch believer that that network needs to be larger. And again, because of the secondary and tertiary effects of building biosurveillance networks. I personally believe uh so let me just give you a notional example. I mean, there are literally hundreds of outbreaks occurring on a daily basis. Most of them are well within the means of the local population to respond to. The concern is, well, what in that outbreak is larger when the local entity, the government, whether it's a district, whether it's a nation, can respond effectively or when it's got true pandemic potential. And how do you separate that out? The one that's the 990 that, hey, they can take care of versus the big eight. That's a real concern. And so the networks that have been described, I mean, are truly fundamental to allowing us to get that information. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go, obviously, but there's been tremendous progress made in recent years. The only comment I'll add to that, because uh, this is not you know, my area to speak specifically on, but the point has been raised that we don't know what the reservoir is right now for this disease. So we don't know what it is. We don't know what the risk factors are for people to come in contact with it. We don't know when it could pop back up again. And it re-emphasizes the point that you're making and, and what my colleagues have talked about, about the urgency and the need for something like a global surveillance system. Thank you. This gentleman in the middle, please. Hi, I'm Robert Malone. I'm a physician scientist and I specialize in, in facilitating the interface between industry and government, particularly DOD and HHS. And uh -huh. I was, uh, let's say, at the street level, um, trying to solve some of the problems with the, we'll call it the VSV Delta G product. Personally, I think you guys are being way too modest. Um, I saw in, in Mr. Spencer's shop and Colonel Coleman's shop, risk-taking, um, advanced risk-taking, to expedite product development, and I saw flexibility in contracting that I have never seen before. And, and I, th I think that the fact that we had millions of doses of, of potentially potent vaccine available in the fall 
reflected that risk taking and that forward thinking. The question I have, and the surprise to me as somebody who kind of specializes in this, is what happened to the FEMSI? I mean, the, the whole logic of that entity was to address this kind of problem and the intergovernmental interface issues that were quite abundant. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I have not had anybody explain to me where that broke down, and, and I'd love to understand it. Was your question what happened to the fencing because your voice sort of dropped there? Okay. That's the question on the table. So do you want to try to tackle that, or do you want me to take a stab at it? Um, go ahead, and I'll pile on. So the FEMC has been around for a while, and it is intended to force so that dialogue and collaboration. Explain to the audience the FEMC. Uh, is everyone familiar with the FEMC? So it's a public health emergency medical countermeasures. Okay. And it's intended to ensure that the U.S. government as a whole is working collaboratively with each other and not competitively to make best use of the limited resources that we have. I think that's probably fairly accurate. And so there's various bodies intended to facilitate this. Uh, and so, although your position may be where was the FEMC, I would say that at the outset there were discussions occurring at the FEMC level, looking at the candidates that were available that could be, you know, accelerated to be able to respond, and there were, you know, decisions made uh, with the FEMC, but of course taken to a higher level as well. And so decisions such as uh, ZMAP was probably the most mm -hmm. viable therapeutic agent, most advanced, and resources would be applied there that the VSV Delta G vaccine was the one that had GMP material and could be accelerated most rapidly. So some of those decisions were made. Now, additionally, we got guidance, and I don't know whether it originated at the FEMC, that, hey, we understand that medical countermeasure development is a risky activity. And so even though we may prioritize ZMAP or VSV Delta G vaccine, please look at the other things in your portfolio and consider how you can accelerate those. And so those sorts of discussions were taking place and discussions were fed back to the FEMC for their awareness. Yeah, the, I'm a member of the FEMC and we did have discussions, but it, in the early phases it was what can each interagency partner bring to the, to the table, if you will. Um, I don't think it broke down I don't think it was effective, as effective as it could have been, and I would acknowledge that. Um, but it was because we were working in crisis mode, and you know, we attend a lot of meetings, but it was about doing and not about meeting. So we, from a DOD perspective, were just trying to pour everything we could into the fight, if you will, and get there as quick as we could. Um, and we may, we may have left some people behind in the process, and that may be one of our lessons learned that that come out of this. But the FEMC um, has been a very good tool for me to ensure that I'm not duplicating what BART is doing or what Department of Homeland Security is doing or what the CDC is doing. It deconflicts so we're not all spending money on the same problem set. What's BARDA? Uh, the acronym. Advanced Research and Development Agency. Yeah. <laughs> say, that, say that again. Yeah. Okay. HH, the Department of Health and Human Services, Services Advanced DHS. Development Entity for Medical Countermeasures. Right. Thank you. And so it enables me, we get a lot of money from, the, from you, from the taxpayers to do this business. And I want to spend it where I can get the biggest bang for the buck. And if BART or CDC or HHS is working on something, I don't want to be working on it. Mm -hmm. I want to leverage what they're doing and take it to the next level if I need it. And I want them to know what I'm spending money on so that they can leverage the, big, the great research that's being done um, and, and they can expend on that. We get the biggest bang for the buck. And it's very good at that. And I'll give you an example. You know, it's easy to say, hey, this fell apart or that fell apart. But things that were in place, many people don't know that the FEMC, I mean, there's a lot of activities going on. So the, the FANG, the Filovirus Animal Non-Clinical Working Group. And this is really over a number of years has harmonized efforts amongst not just DOD and not just HHS, but with allied nations as well, standardizing, okay, what type of pathogen will we use for our standard material? And that's provided tremendous value to all the organizations and in many ways best positioned us 
to be able to respond as as effectively as we did. But, but aspirin and FEMC did not play a significant um, oh, Hold on. Re re rephrase your question so our internet and C-SPAN on other audience can hear it. And please speak a little louder. <coughs> um, I had understood that aspirin and FEMC um, by uh, directive um, at, by their charter were to play a key leadership role in a situation like this and I, I that hence my question ah. in uh, in an operational sense a uh, tactical and operational sense and that that was the gap that I was referring to I understand all right other questions for the panelists well, please uh, join me in thanking this excellent group of experts and thank them for keeping us all safe. Mm -hmm.